so uh, let's look at so the last point we discussed uh, the other day what we were looking at uh, if we look at your notes right last point we discussed was uh, we were trying to look at the um, how the project uh, when you have we are trying to fit the whole project and fee scheme into the uh, buy sell paradigm remember that so we were trying to say that everything in that left box everything on the left hand uh, side uh, in the value we'll just call instead of using such a big word a big expression like value versus price comparison based analysis we will just say value versus price in the value versus price world the basic framework okay is if you if market price is above fair value then you sell it if it's below fair value then you buy it so how does that work in the case of the project what we were discussing yesterday is um was it in this one we just have to find the the notes it's a, the notes are a little bit uh, all over the place i will consolidate them i'm in the process of consolidating i'll make uh, very soon you'll have a consolidated note where you can study everything about models okay i've added one more point here to all those uh, improper uses the uh, uses of the word arbitrage okay remember we discussed cra so you should have a very clear understanding in your mind of what is CRA. It must be a transaction where all instant, uh, all market risk is removed, and everything is instantaneously locked in. Okay, market risk must be completely removed, and so there's another. And so all these terms that are used in the industry, you can see so many terms that are used using the word arbitrage, and I don't even think I've covered everything. Okay, uh, I've added one more term, which is statistical arbitrage. That is also actually not CRA. Okay, although they use the word, I'll explain what status. Uh, I'll, later on, I'll explain what stat arb is. It's basically, looking at uh, historical relationships. So essentially, in stat arb, what you would do is look at like uh, you know historical relationships. Okay, uh, I'll just explain this briefly here. Where's our? I just briefly explain that up. It's still on the subject of models, so we're just deviating a little bit from what we discussed the other day. But uh, in in between of in between the discussion of uh, the NPV framework and how it fits into the buy sell, uh, uh, the NPV model and how it fits into the buy sell paradigm. Okay, so let's do one thing. Let's make this a chart of GM. Okay, I think the GM, uh, General, everybody understands GM, General Motors, okay, very big car company, okay, uh, and then we are going to do a comparison between, yeah, compare or add, let's call it Ford Motor, okay, so let's compare GM and Ford, now you understood what I'm trying to do, it's like comparing Maruti and uh, who else, Karma car company that we have in India, <coughs> Hyundai, yeah, if we have the stock of Hyundai listed in India, okay, so then we compare Maruti versus Hyundai. So similarly, we are comparing where Ford versus um, General Motors. Okay, so this is General Motors. You can see the dramatic dis, uh, discrepancy in the pr price performance. Okay, that uh, this is up and this is down. Can you see how much difference there is? This ad business is coming again. Okay, you you can see now these are actually both car companies and reasonably big uh, car companies, so they are comparable. You're not comparing a small company with a big company. So what essentially was the the philosophy behind statistical arbitrage is basically uh, why is it called statistical because uh, this is it once again another use of improper use of the word arbitrage um, so let me have it yeah so essentially be, uh, um, I sell assets um, when they are out of line uh, with each other relative to historical um, data let's say historical that's where the statistical part comes in this historical data is where the statistical part comes in so essentially the philosophy try to understand the philosophy here what the philosophy <laughs> are behind statistical arbitrage is that you take a couple of assets which are related okay so here I should put in another word here 
which is that buy sell uh, to related assets okay so it's not like I'm uh, comparing Apple to Ford Motor okay I'm comparing General Motors to Ford Motor so I'm my theory is that since these are both global car companies their performance should have some broad similarity because if there's any trend in the auto industry it should affect both of them equally and all that so so you take the basic idea you take some two related assets but related doesn't mean that they're identical okay <coughs> They're obviously two different companies, so there are certain. You remember your, in your CAPM, you did the idea of uh, systematic risk and non-systematic risk. Yes. Okay, so every company has some idiosyncratic risk. Okay, so that will cause some differences in the share prices, but they're also not going to be ident. Uh, they're not going to be too far out of line. Should not be because the same industry. Okay, so what you do then is this is just four hours of data. You can actually take much longer data. They usually will take many many years of data, and what they will do is they look at. Um, uh, you can see here again here also there's a lot of difference okay that uh, Ford is generally underperforming okay uh, so uh, here what they'll do is they'll take many many years of data to for two related assets and they will look at the historical relationship between these two assets so they'll maybe come out in this case there's quite a large discrepancy but they actually might say can you see here that for a while it was moving all together closely yes. okay so and now the prices have started to diverge okay prices have started to diverge now the performance since late 2016 has started to diverge Ford Motor has gone much lower and this has gone done relatively better okay so now his the, the idea of statistical arbitrage is that the guy will look at it now here in this kind of a situation and say look for so many years we had such a close relationship and now these prices have gone out of line with each other this situation can't be sustained okay so they're basically going to insist that the historical relationship will have to be maintained okay so it's it's uh, so that is the basic uh, the understand just understand the thinking behind it that you take two related assets you take a lot of historical data and you see how the historical pattern is okay this may not be a very good example but uh, because there's equal amounts of time diverging and being together but uh, but i just you get the idea right so they would typically look at this part of it and say historically they have been so closely related but now they have gone far out of line with each other okay so therefore the idea is once again the idea of convergence okay okay these are also called sometimes these are also called that's why these are also called convergence trades okay uh, these statistical arbitrage trades are also called convergence trades okay so this idea of uh, uh, the you remember yesterday I gave you the example of this uh, uh, fund called LTCM long-term capital management which went to bust during the uh, the Asian financial crisis and the Russian default so LTCM was actually doing this kind of activity okay essentially they were doing this kind of convergence so convergence trades convergence arbitrage sometimes they call it convergence or sometimes they call it convergence trades understand why it's convergence and why it's statistical convergence means this is a convergence trade so what will the guy do now can you guess based on what I told you so the guy who believes in stat arb who's a st the statistical arbitrage for short is referred to as stat arb okay so now the guy who is a stat arb trader what is he going to do here when he sees this situation if he believes that this is the true reality if he believes that this is the true relationship that the two prices have to now converge so what will he do what trade will he do by now you should have understood what is the basic framework of arbitrage buy Ford and sell GM very good okay so you have understood the idea behind arbitrage that you see that these things have fallen so far out of line with the historical norm and that's where the statistical part comes in you do your analysis of standard deviation for many 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 years and you see that it has now gone three standard deviations behind the beyond or four standard deviations you have some limit so you say if it goes beyond 4 SD or 5 SD then I will jump in because it can't stay beyond like that uh, beyond 5 SD for so long for, for too long so eventually it has to come back together okay so are you following this logic here okay so they're essentially saying that this is also a fair value based kind of thinking because you're saying that the fair value of the difference between these two is somewhere well, like what we used to see over here and now the fair value has become too wide the different I mean the difference the market price of the difference has become too wide so this market price has to converge to the fair value and become much less is everyone clear so in a situation like this <coughs> they would be buying Ford and selling GM the idea behind idea here is that eventually the two have to converge okay 
because that historical norm has to prevail so now you understand why it's also called the statistical arbitrage okay because the statistical comes from this part that the analysis of all this SD analysis and all that you do here okay many funds are doing this actually many there is a very famous fund called Renaissance Technologies which is one of the most successful hedge funds what they do is a basically a variety of this but they do it in a very diversified way across many many markets okay with different strategies different norms one model might be doing it if uh, 3 SD is crossed one model might be doing it if 6 SD is crossed okay so they have a lot of diversification built in but the basic idea is a lot of statistical arbitrage so if you hear stat up this is what basically the thinking it can be applied to various asset asset classes various markets and instruments okay but the thinking is always like this between behind statistical arbitrage or um, uh, convergence trading okay this is the idea so once again you can see that can you see why it's not CRA because if I buy Ford and uh, and sell GM, there's no guarantee. I'm not locking in any price. I have. I still have to wait for the thing to happen, for the convergence to happen, which God knows if it'll happen or not. Okay, it's the same as somebody who buys Ford, thinking that wow, Ford has fallen so far, it looks really, really undervalued and underpriced relative to fair value. The same thing. It's still a risky trade because you don't know what the market is going to do. There's no way to force the market to come to your fair value because there's no CRA kind of setting. Okay, is this? Clear? so another term that you learned another strategy okay that you've learned so if this can also be a module for some of these people have gone for interviews Shuchi and Anjum yes, yes, yes. okay the interview is not on campus No, sir. <laughs> okay 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 so I guess they will be marked up present later that's okay that we'll take care of so I was just telling them Shuchi was asking yesterday what to study and all that so I mean I, I've already told you this before for your interviews that uh, you prepare into obviously one as you read as widely as possible follow the markets and you try to anticipate the questions that come right but the que uh, the other thing that so there are two types of questions either you, you will get a out of the blue question and that you can't really prepare for specifically but then you also prepare the second thing they might ask you is so what have you studied if you could not answer the first question or what tell me what have you studied so here you should be ready with certain concepts which you have mastered thoroughly so you can say we talked about arbitrage free valuation models so in that we discuss classical riskless arbitrage so we have also learned about the difference between what is CRA and what is not CRA and you can give all these examples merger up stat up wall up all these are actually called ARB, but they are not actually CRA. So these are improper uses of the word arbitrage. So this can, this can, so you have to think in a, you understand modules? Yes, sir. Okay, everything is a module, right? So you can think in a modular way about topics, but then you have to master the topics. If you take option trading as one topic, then the whole in and out of option trading, you should be able to talk confidently about it, right? <coughs> so this is how you should prepare. <coughs> okay. So uh, this is another term that you have learned. Now with uh, this, we will just go back to our discussion yesterday with the NPV uh, part. Okay, buy sell two related assets when they are out of line. Now you understand based on what I have explained and what I have written here, you should understand what it is. Okay, all right. So uh, we go back to our discussion of uh, the discussion we were having yesterday about uh, the um, yeah. So this being the market price of the project, what we discussed, okay. So if you see here, you can just go through. I don't want to spend too much more time on this. Where is the calc file? Yeah. So I just the basic idea here is that. Okay, so we'll make this 90. So, all right. Okay. So the idea is here. If you see again in the case of uh, so in the case of the project, what you're comparing is. Where did I have that? So you're comparing the fair value of the project to the, and now I've lost that NPV um, chart. But anyway, you understand the concept of NPV already. So we'll just leave it there. Okay. So you're comparing. So in the NPV equation, you have that minus C0 term. Okay. And that minus C0 is essentially like the market price. So when the NPV is positive, it means essentially that. So that equation can be rewritten as fair value minus, uh, fair value, uh, minus market price. Right. So when the fair value is minus market price is positive, okay, then it is uh, positive NPV and that's when you are actually buying it. 
you're accepting the project it's like buying the project okay and when you reject the project it's like selling the project in a situation where you can't sell but at least you don't buy right okay so we can actually show that you can actually it's just like selling the project okay so if you do this for any of these things you'll see that essentially it's the same this framework applies this framework that we have given you here okay which is that this concept of this, this general framework which applies to everything over here on this side okay that this can be applied that this all these fit the framework okay that all of these are essentially our fair value methods okay so when you do bonds also when you discount the cash flows of the bond you get the fair value of the bond and if the market price is is less than the fair value then you buy otherwise you sell right same fr framework same for stocks the formula directly gives you like a Gordon growth model gives you the fair value of the bond of the stock okay so this we have already done now what we have to test is the other point is this clear so far to everyone yeah so we'll go on to the now we go back to your question okay remember I asked you a question okay so we are applying this by uh, this framework to all the uh, asset valuation models okay which we have the uh, forecast based asset valuation models which we discussed right now okay now um, what are we now where do is I need to find that okay. okay now we come to your question you remember your question that I asked you what is the difference between project IRR and bond NPV uh, sorry bond YTM and project IRR anybody has the answer to that yes anybody has an answer with on this on this point okay so I'm showing you both of those okay um, both of you everyone can see this others you can also read the writing maybe the the stuff is a little bit small now you can see you can even make it uh, and you can see where 11 is where is f11 where is my f11 i can't even see my f11 that, that i know but where is my f10 I, I can't even see it okay all right now it's a hopefully a little bit better so now we are discussing this important point okay nobody has the answer to this the question is very simple what is the mathematical difference in mathematical terms okay what is the difference between project irr and bond and uh, bond ytm is the question clear yes, sir. okay so this is your answer i will put all this into your notes everything will be there in a consolidated note in about <coughs> within one or two days okay but i think now uh, this now this, this zoom is too big to allow others to see i made it too big then now okay so now you can see everything yes sir, yes, sir. okay this is your npv equation uh, this is your irr equation okay this all the thing all we are doing in this irr is basically we are moving this to this because cfo anyway has a cf0 has a negative sign okay so it's a cf all we are doing in the irr equation is that we are moving this to this side yes correct yes. and we are repeatedly doing trial and error to find out su such such an irr which makes the right hand rhs equal to the lhs yes okay that's your project IRR that you know okay now bond YTM you remember the equation of the bond YTM also you can see it in the on the lower side yes <coughs> everybody can see bond YTM you remember this LHS is bond price yes, sir. you remember this Shreya is not able to recognize bond YTM output is YTM. Output yes output is ytm okay that i could have asked you again as a question but you already answered it before the question was asked it is ytm uh, uh, so pulkit has already given us the right answer that mathematically there is no difference between bond uh, ytm and project irr okay now let's understand why that answer is correct yes Kushbu, you're not feeling well yeah so then why did you go home so whatever rule I made, that rule is uh, there are medical. If I, if I feel anybody is not feeling well, if I f see somebody is not feeling well, or if somebody mm -hmm. says I'm not feeling well, and it, then you go home now. No, I'm just I don't You're sure? Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, okay, guys, please concentrate. Parol, concentrate. Have you understood Polkit's answer? Yes, sir. So how can they be the same? Okay, mathematically. I said mathematically not conceptually that what is the question mathematical terms in mathematical terms why are they the same okay so why has Polkit answered the same now let's let Polkit give the explanation give him the mic <laughs> give the explanation now your answer is correct 
that in mathematical terms there is no difference. Now you explain your answer to Pulk uh, to Chuk. And uh, so I think uh, we just we have just taken the variable name of the variable, but the formula is okay. Let's start with the LHS. In the LHS, in, uh, uh, in bond writing formula we have bond price. In that higher formula we have uh, initial investment. Initial uh, the yeah. Project cost, project cost, which we have already shown is equal to the market price of the project. Yes, sir. yes? correct. So we have shown that the project cost is equal to the market price of the project effectively like that because for the guy who is evaluating the project that's what he has to pay to buy the project. Okay. You can imagine a already constructed line that you are buying instead of constructing the line. Okay. So therefore it's the same. So the LHS is the same conceptually because in both cases you are looking at the price of the asset. The market price of the asset. So in both cases LHS is equal to the market price of the asset. Yes, Shivam, you are following? Okay, both cases is equal to the market price of the asset. All right. So now, uh, Ritesh, you are also not feeling well. Then go, go, go home. Don't, don't wait. Don't take a uh, for it. Whatever uh, rules, don't they don't apply in case of medical emergency. If anybody is not feeling well, if I feel they don't, uh, of course, don't. I mean, this is only for it should not be abused. This privilege also should not be abused. But I can usually make out by looking at people's faces when they are not feeling well. Yes, Parul, you also want to become. <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay Kushbo, you can also leave whenever you want okay all right guys let's let's cement this understanding clearly make sure that you understand this is all important for your conceptual understanding you were not clear about this earlier right yes sir. so it's all important for your all we are covering the same basic stuff you've done earlier but we are making sure that your uh, understanding is 360 degrees everything is clear conceptually conceptual understanding is very important okay all right so uh, the left hand side uh, Pulkit has already shown that left hand side both are the same thing we just have different names for it okay what is the market price of the, the second now let's look at the RHS let's look at the numerators on the IH RHS can we say that the numerators on the RHS are all returns returns from the what is the problem Parun what is the problem? you want to go that side okay okay so the numerator in the on the RHS the numerators on the RHS can we generalize them by saying that they are both returns both of the numerators on the RHS are both periodic returns yes, yes? correct Puneet you agree okay both are periodic returns of the same of the asset of the general in general forms we write this expression then it is the uh, periodic returns of the asset both of them okay then in the numerator we have the same mathematical expression one plus r now that r may be a irr or it may be a ytm but the uh, numerator also the denominator also is the same all the periodic den denominators are the same except i mean the powers are also the same okay yes everyone agrees right so now you can see that mathematical terms uh, this uh, this also you should have this understanding to complete your understanding of models conceptual understanding that there is no mathematical difference between the bond ytm and the project uh, irr okay because all of the you can take it stepwise that everything is the same basically left hand side is equal to market price of asset rhs numerator is equal to returns from asset rhs denominators are equal to discount factor in general terms we can call it a discount factor what is what p p is the principal no see basically this is there is okay good question very good question okay very observant also noted that this should have been written as one term because you see the power here is the same the power here is the same right so this is bullet repayment of principal so this could have been written as cn plus p okay so it would not show as two terms so this is how uh, many many times we write it like that cn plus p okay so it's the same last period payment okay so Paul has raised a very good question which is they are not the same so she is protesting that they are not the same because it's a very good point uh, now i may have to go out okay i'll come i'll write it down later on but let me first explain it because i don't want to get out of this uh, uh, f11 view full screen view okay the answer in project analysis <coughs> do you remember something called salvage value yes, yes, right yes, yes, so the salvage value is what is what you get by selling the plant at the end of the project 
okay so can we call salvage value in general terms can we can we say like the the disposal value of the asset yes. the terminal value of the asset yes. okay terminal asset value yes can we say that okay now is the principal of the bond can we call it the terminal asset value yes because both are inflows in the case of salvage value you sell the project at the end of the period and you sell the plant and you get some money and in the case of the bond also you return the bond certificate and the issuer of the bond gives you the final principal payment yes clear okay so they are the same now you can see that in the project analysis typically you will have some kind of maybe not always but in general terms you can write salvage value okay so uh, therefore this can be like a so, so uh, but in most cases you will have some kind of value that can be realized by selling the project by the plant and all the other yeah so in project uh, IRR what is the uh, thing that we getting in uh, what is the salvage value no see what will happen is typically see uh, if you take this format if you take this format which is the more general format okay since we are anyway saying that mathematically they are identical okay because anyway we know that there's general asset valuation framework okay so uh, the mathematically these are identical they are flowing from the NPV equation you can think of it that way now if you take this way of writing the last term if you combine these two because the power is the same okay and if you take cn plus p by this okay as the last term and if you take this as the general framework or the general uh, form of this uh, writing the last term then if you take this term once again and then rewrite it in this general form if you rewrite it in this general form this cfn okay if you want to keep it identical with the uh, nature of the other cash flows in the previous periods this let it be the return uh, the the kind of a revenue return from the project like uh, revenue from operations okay but this cfn should be added there should be another term in the numerator the cfn plus sb salvage value then that will have the same form as this are you following what i'm saying at the end of the period you have some re revenue returns so we want to distinguish the revenue returns from the <laughs> capital receipts remember we did a case a revenue receipt versus capital receipt yes. in income tax law we have this important consideration so in income tax law uh, what kind of expenses what kind of expense is deductible for the purposes of computing taxable income revenue expense or capital expense <laughs> Revenue. revenue expense is deductible capital expense is not deductible which is why in many income tax cases the litigation involves the question of uh, centers around the question of whether a certain expense is a revenue expense or a capital expense okay remember we did that case called empire jute mills okay which is quite a landmark case in indian uh, income tax litigation okay so where if you remember rajan also raised this important point on the linguistic point which is the use of the word expense versus expenditure whether they are the same thing okay that actually the correct use of the word should be expense not expenditure because expenditure involves basically outflow of cash but it need not be a PL debit in that period if you go back to our discussion of that time okay remember the discussion this you should know also as an accounting matter right it's all there in your lab notes if you go back to your lab notes <laughs> Rajan asked this question when we were doing this case okay because in many of these uh, income tax cases the judges who are not trained as accountants okay they keep writing expenditure expenditure revenue expenditure but actually that is not correct okay the correct use of the word is uh, the correct expression should be expense because you are always talking about the tax tax PNL you are talking about the computation of the tax PNL okay so what goes into PNL not necessarily expenditure you may have an expenditure which does not show as an expense in that period if you are capitalizing you know what is capitalizing of expenditures if say whatever let's say disney was launching planning to launch this disney plus service for the last two years and they have been advertising for the last two years trying to build up demand for the disney plus service okay now if the disney plus service has not started operations they should not expense let's say they spent 10 million dollars each year on marketing the disney plus service in 2017 and 2018 okay and they are only going to launch in 2019 so then 2017 and 2018 those 10 million dollars each should not have gone to their PL debit uh, they should not have shown as expenses in the PL. are you following because you have to match the uh, ongoing operations to the expenses 
you don't show the expenses until the actual business operation has commenced remember that yes are you following what we are saying yes. matching concept you understand okay so we loosely say matching revenues to expenses but actually the right way to state that principle is that the expense if it relates to a particular kind of business operation when the commencement of that business operation happens only then you should start taking those expenses to the PNL. are you following the logic okay so it's not just loosely matching revenues to expenses because there may not be any revenues so you may be just but the business has started <coughs> business has started maybe you are giving three months free trial if you are giving three months free trial okay there's no revenue because everybody is on free trial but expenses are happening and in this case you can launch uh, you can deduct the expenses because the business operation has commenced are you following the discussion right so 2017 and 18 they are building up demand for disney plus advertising spending 20 million 10 million dollars each year but they cannot ex they should not expense those 10 million dollar costs in those two years 17 and 18 because the business of disney plus is starting only in 2019 yes are you following this is the proper application of the matching concept okay so uh, why did i come here expense expenditure capital expense because we came here because we were discussing salvage salvage value and the right way to light this last term is cfn plus salvage value okay in that case you're making a distinction between this revenue income the revenue flow okay the revenue receipt here the cfn is a revenue receipt from the business operations of the plant okay and the salvage value will be the capital receipt from the sale of the plant are you following what we are discussing yes so from that point of distinction between revenue receipts and capital receipts we went to do income tax law which is how you should study you should always study everything from a multidisciplinary perspective it helps enriches your understanding right so then uh, we went into that and we discussed this concept of what is deductible so it's revenue expenses are deductible and then we went into the proper use of the word so the word that should be used is expense not expenditure okay and then we went into the distinction between expenditure and expense okay so the classical distinction is that expenditure is only an outflow of cash you can go back and read it again i'm not going to spend too much time explaining it once again it's there in your lab notes which means it's there in the lab videos also okay for your class so expense um expenditure basically only means an outflow of cash so those let's say go back to the disney plus example in 2017 and 2018 they have spent 10 million dollars each so those advertisers have to be paid facebook has to be paid google has to be paid for the ads so the cash is flowing out okay but those uh, the corresponding credit cash corresponding debit is not to the pnl it is not an expense that you are taking in those years you are capitalizing that expense so that later on when you start the you start the so by the time you start your operations in 2019 you have already capitalized 20 million dollars of advertising expense are you following so now when you will now when you have uh, when you have started your operations in 2018 now you will start debiting those expenses okay you will follow a system of some prorata system and then now you start debiting those expenses and then you'll credit the debit balance you have built up in your capitalized advertising expenditure account <coughs> are you following the logic so everything is connected you are connecting finance to income tax law also to accounting entries journal entries I hope everybody is clear about journal entries. 100% clear. So when you are doing this uh, initial 17-18, uh, 2017-18, okay, uh, you are uh, spending 10 million dollars each. So you are crediting cash because you are paying cash to buy your Facebook ads, yes, <coughs> okay, and to buy your billboards wherever okay spending money on billboards all the ad expenditures paying let's say coming in cash you're crediting cash everyone is clear about that yes. and you are debiting let's say an account which you will call capitalized advertising expenditure account yes so you build up a 20 million dollar debit balance there then now comes 2019 when the business commences okay so you will have other new expenses for 2019 itself but you'll follow some formula of maybe that capitalized amount i have to debit i have to expense out over two years or three years usually there's some accounting rules also okay let's say you have to do it in say some number of years so you'll follow so every year every month you will t or, or every year you will take let's say 50 percent of it okay you have to finish it in two years then the first year you will take in addition to whatever you are actually doing in 2019 in 2019 also you'll be spending some money yes so you'll be debiting that directly to the pnl as expenses plus you will be debiting some of the historical expenses which are capitalized 
so for that again the entry will be you will debit PNL advertising expense and you will credit that as, as a, that balance account that you have built that that's a debit balance account are you following yes capitalized advertising expenditure that's a debit balance account 20 billion dollar 20 million dollar starting balance so this 2019 you will take the hit of 10 million dollars into the PNL so you will debit 10 million here and you will credit 10 million there so that balance will now come down by 10 million are you following now okay so in this discussion itself you have connected three different disciplines finance income tax law and uh, in accounting to make sure that everything so as an MBA student this is what is required of you that you should have total fluidity between all these different disciplines you can't say oh I'm a finance student I can't go to income tax law so uh, I can't do accounting you are expected to do everything okay you should be able to cover all the domains okay and then if there is a marketing angle to this maybe they should have started marketing in 2015 according to you whatever so there's a marketing angle to that that also you have to bring in okay so you have to be able to connect that's what people expect from MBAs okay because you're not a hardcore programmer or something okay so you have to bring a certain different skill set to the table the skill set you're bringing to the table among other things communication skills office productivity software all that stuff okay very tech savvy the other skill that you're bringing the most important skill that you're bringing to the table the most important skill is this ability to integrate different domains of business into a business into a, any given business situation this is clear any analysis this is what you have to work on when you want to polish your skills as an MBA student yes everybody's following okay all right so uh, Paolo so is your question about salvage value satisfactorily answered yeah so we will write it ideally as a last term mm -hmm. CFN plus salvage value in the end that equates the two equations that equates the two expressions okay that they are identical actually conceptually they are the same okay so that finishes our uh, other topic so, yeah. Yes, you can say that also from a computational point of view. Both are, don't say hit and trial. <laughs> don't say hit and trial method. <laughs> Some people have written that. Uh, you can say trial and error is slightly better than hit that hit and trial. Okay, because the hit is also a trial. <laughs> so uh, the the correct expression is to say. I have written it in your notes iterative approximation okay so when you do these kind of things like moving the left minus term CF0 to the left hand side <coughs> these are called analytic solutions things that you can solve by doing this you can those are called analytic solutions so the correct mathematical expression is iterative approximation okay that you iterate iteration you understand one run second run third run okay in IT you have this concept of first pass when you're testing memory if you run a mem test you'll see that the mem test the system does a first pass then it has second pass third pass it keeps on this pass is the iteration okay so uh, iterative approximation is the expression that you should use because remember another thing that you're expected to do as an MBA is to use uh, you know sophisticated language proper language not like a layman's language like hit and trial you have to use the correct technical terms okay so that's the, the point of being an MBA right that you have already been trained in a business school okay so we have understood this concept now of uh, okay so we are here we are going to cover this point right um, project IRR versus bond ITM bond YTM now what happened this is hanging a little bit no no this is actually the wrong one here okay so okay so we have done this more or less okay so everything is now covered okay now I think we are ready to move uh, to your let me just check if I have any other topic to cover examples of uh, I think we have made it pretty much done so now I'm going to move on to your uh, now we'll move on to your case actually for futures also we have covered okay because I want to start your case because I'm a little bit worried about how much time we are going to have so we have a class tomorrow as well 
in the morning right so relentless for you guys so I, I harass you in the evening and then as soon as you come to college I harass, I harass you again <laughs> okay <laughs> this is like a, a teacher harassment a new kind of uh, disease okay um, okay so um, what we are going to do is we'll have a try and have a discussion in the next class uh, in the class tomorrow but uh, we'll open this so what you guys should already start doing is uh, because we are going to be on a very tight schedule because of these very tight quadrimesters not even two months properly uh, it's very difficult to do these projects uh, in a satisfactory way but we'll make the best of whatever as something is better than nothing so we at least we'll get a flavor of things and we'll learn something along the way okay so remember all these contracts needed for the project I have put the euro dollar uh, futures contract okay this is the interest rate futures contract this is not in bold because this is not being gonna gonna be actually used in the project although it is part of the case discussion okay so these other projects you better familiar these other contracts you better make yourself familiar with these futures contracts okay and already start trading in your in your uh, thing here you can see that all these uh, things are already there the crude oil futures go and see the go to the quotes page see which months are trading make yourself aware of which are the ones with the high volume uh, which are the high volume months okay because here also just like options you have another extra decision problem which contract should I trade because there are many different month contract trading contracts trading at a point of time which month should I trade okay so those things make yourself familiar with all these contracts okay gold copper uh, Aussie uh, yen uh, crude oil okay try to figure out how this yen why is this yen price showing this when you look at this dollar yen price here in this form okay and why is this yen futures contract these are all against the US dollar okay so uh, only one is shown but actually this is again the question that Rajan asked there's only one contract okay uh, that it's actually again obviously there has to be two there have to be two assets in any given market so the asset that is not stated is the US dollar okay so this Aussie if we put an Aussie quote here you can see this is familiar uh, this is a standard as the quote uh, the same way the spot Aussie is quoted but here can you see a difference between the dollar yen spot and the yen futures contract can you see a difference? Yes, yes. Why do you think this difference is arising? So base asset, base, 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 base asset and interchange. Yes, so base asset and terms asset and been interchange. In the futures contract, the CME Globex uh, yen futures, okay, the yen has been made into a base asset, okay. So you have to look at the contract size and all that. So your case has been structured in such a way that it is around your total exposure is a round multiple of the CME in the, on the currency side and also on the commodity side, the exposures are round multiples of the CME contract sizes. So that when you trade using CME contracts, if necessary, you can go to 100% hedged. Okay, so we'll see all those situations. Okay, so make the point I'm trying to say emphasize here is we have very little time. Okay, because I have to cover all these. Uh, I have to cover all the theoretical foundation for your project to help you to do it so it will be always less than satisfactory as an experience because of the tight schedule that we face okay ideally I would teach you all the theory first and then do the project but we don't have that luxury okay so you have to understand that okay so do your best to understand all these pro uh, uh, futures contracts inside out refer to the book the futures chapter okay understand the contract inside out all right so now let's go and start the case discussion okay so let's get you familiar with with the um, uh, the case that we have okay anything else in futures that we wanted to talk, talk about physical delivery all this stuff we already covered open interest but it's okay open interest I'll discuss later it's not a critical point at this I don't want to delay the case discussion because um, I need to start the project so we're going to go straight to the case discussion okay futures then case and project discussion so we can close this now okay so let's go bond YTM versus project IRR okay here now I'm going to write down okay I'm going to write down the point that Parul raised bond principle so I'm going to just write this here to um, remind you guys is equal to project salvage value okay this will remind you of the discussion that bond principle is equal to project self salvage value okay now we go to our next topic which is case okay all right now let's understand this case try to um, 
So again, I'll put this into your notes, but anyway, just get the feel of it. I'll just move this into your case. So this is our case. I'll just give you a feel for this um, instead of making you read the uh, notes. Okay, this is going to be the thing that you're going to analyze. Okay. This is actually a case that I have prepared as a general uh, case to cover all the problems in corporate treasury risk management. So let's understand the problems first, okay? And then we will go into the theoretical foundations that you need to solve these problems. But so the, the, uh, the right way to do it is first read the case and understand, try to get a flavor of the problem. You will not understand everything, but try to get a flavor of it. Then go back and read the theoretical foundations, okay? Which will be given to you as technical notes. Read the technical notes and then again, come back and try to solve the problem problems okay so let me just explain the balance sheet first okay so this is the balance sheet of this company which is basically a natural resources company okay and you can see uh, so it's a stylized the first thing is it's a stylized balance sheet you know what a stylized balance sheet is a stylized balance sheet means it's not a full balance sheet it's not a it's not a typical reporting regulatory reporting balance sheet which you have okay where you have to follow the accounting standards all the items are listed okay it's not a full balance sheet for reporting purposes a stylized balance sheet means i have taken it's like an abstraction of a balance sheet so i have taken certain key factors or it has the general properties of a balance sheet like assets and liabilities have to equal okay and the items that i've shown are not some you know funny stuff which doesn't appear on a balance sheet it has some stuff which appears on a balance sheet but it is only stylized and i have taken certain highlights of the balance sheet okay it's not a full form balance sheet like i've not shown the fixed assets okay so it's a artificial kind of balance sheet where i'm showing total assets does not include any fixed assets which is very unnatural but for the sake of our discussion i have tried to keep the fixed assets out okay so that's what it means to say that it's a stylized so when you say if you see the balance sheet and think what kind of balance sheet is this? There's, there's no fixed assets okay because it's been done on purpose to include only what is required for the purposes of our discussion and for the purposes of understanding the basic principles of corporate treasury risk management okay now we are talking about a different kind of problem in the first two projects you have done this kind of stuff buying and selling as a speculator you have functioned as a speculator in your first two projects okay because your goal was you started with one million dollars okay in cash okay so you had no risk on your book okay and then you started with that and then your goal was to increase risk to make money so remember the definition of speculator first transaction will increase your total risk okay so your increased total total risk had to increase with the first transaction you'll be buying something or selling something okay so in both the first two projects you function as a speculator now in this project you will function as a hedger so which means you'll see that your total risk will have to reduce in your first transaction you cannot increase under the golden rules of hedging okay which you will be introduced to you will not be allowed to um, uh, increase risk so you have to remain true to the profile of the hedger so your first transaction so there'll be a marked difference in the uh, approach okay so but make yourself familiar and also draw up the charts for all these markets because you'll have to trade them so please make yourself familiar how am i going to trade start forming views on the assets okay look at the oil chart and start forming views is it going up or going down practice and see what happens form a view and then see if you're right okay so let's look at this balance sheet once again is everyone on board so far are you following okay now we're going to follow so this this whole things this is a case which is uh, we will look at the spreadsheet we'll look at the case problem we we'll look read the technical notes we'll have the discussion plus plus at the end we will also and while going on while going on with the discussion because we don't have much time we will also start the project which where you will be functioning as the treasurer of this company managing this balance sheet basically doing corporate treasury risk management you will be in charge of that okay so let's look at the balance sheet here okay it's got three three assets okay you can see I'm not going to read out everything it's a natural resources company so the essentially what are the assets the assets are just and the numbers are also you might think that this is a very small balance sheet of 6.7 million dollars okay the numbers have been kept artificially small because of various constraints because we have only one million dollars of equity you know IB has given us only one million dollars of equity so if I have a massive balance sheet okay ideally in a in a natural resources company your balance sheet will be even your uh, inventory positions will be in billions of dollars okay but if I have such a big balance sheet then I try to hedge the whole thing 
one million dollars of cash in my trading account is not enough to uh, to do that job okay so in order to keep it within the realms of the one million dollar limit imposed by IB okay that's why I have made this such a small balance sheet okay because you have to put up margin then prices may move then you have to put up more margin so you must have enough money to cover your losses as well as your initial margin deposits so because of all that so that's another thing that you might notice that it doesn't have stuff like fixed assets and the balance sheet size is also very small the, the size does not matter because your thinking process is not going to change whatever thinking process you learn in this balance sheet with uh, by the by using this balance sheet it will not change in any way okay when you manage a multi-billion dollar balance sheet the thinking process remains exactly the same is that clear to everyone just like when you have done US equity option trading you have been taught certain theoretical concepts like how to uh, what kind of options to sell if you're on the selling side that you should be in short dated options those theoretical principles will not change one bit if you are trading in Indian equity options nothing will change theoretically okay your instruments will change that's all the actual underlying assets will change okay but nothing else will change theoretically nothing changes so the size of the balance sheet does not affect your learning yeah yeah I mean obviously it's a stylized balance sheet they will also have you know lots of uh, fixed assets okay they'll have other they'll have other kinds of loans I am severely restricted because I had to create a yen loan I had to create an Aussie loan okay and then because I am only playing with 6.7 million dollars so in that I have to create a reasonable yen loan a reasonable Aussie loan then I have to create a dollar loan also and you can see the size of the dollar loan is very small okay this is all very artificial but the point is that even the the thinking process that you go through to manage a hundred plus hundred thousand dollar dollar loan is exactly the same that you would to manage a ten billion dollar dollar loan the thinking process does not change I have to put in these small numbers because of the constraints of the IB account there are only one million dollars of uh, money in each account okay all right people are falling asleep please stay awake okay uh, please pay attention just we have a few more minutes make sure that you get, uh, get the value from the uh, class okay water bottles are not sufficiently filled <laughs> please make sure you fill your water bottles sufficiently in the uh, in the uh, in the beginning before the class okay if there's a water emergency I can allow someone to go out but you have to take all the water bottles yes, and you will be the Lakshman of the class you'll go and get water for everybody okay is there any uh, who wants to, uh, who will go Verma will go no 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 we will send somebody reliable <laughs> Verma will go <laughs> you go and fill all the water bottles go and fill all the water bottles and come back quickly Gil also you can give your water bottle okay now just concentrate for a while and we'll understand make some we have to make headway because our time is very limited okay all right are you guys following so far if you have any problem any other water bottles okay mining come mining in mining also you need a lot of water so okay so the assets are basically okay guys now no no disturbance here okay concentrate what has happened what is history looking at concentrate on what is being discussed okay concentrate on what is being discussed so the assets assets are basically just the current assets and only the inventories we have not shown any cash also okay very unusual balance sheet so there's assets is only the inventory side okay only the inventories of the material that they are mining okay they're they're mining and a sort of uh, digging out from the ground in the case of oil you we wouldn't say mining okay uh, we say exploration okay so uh, and the asset side okay now these are actually the these are the market prices okay these are the market prices okay this is per dollars per barrel this is do uh, dollars and cents per pound and this is also dollars and this is also do dollars and cents per pound in copper and gold is troy ounce and this is uh, barrels okay okay are you guys following no uh, be quiet and uh, follow what is discuss being discussed eating sharing food doesn't require you to talk you just share as if you can't talk okay so um, all right okay 
guys now asset side is clear to everyone yes sir okay now uh, liability side we have it's not very pretty the display is not very pretty but you can understand it so on the asset side we had we have four components i'm sorry on the liability side on the liability side we have four components okay at the high level we have two components what will be the two components on the high level and the in on the on any balance sheet what are the two components on the uh, uh, i mean this is slightly american time style terminology so the two components is net worth and outside liabilities at a high level okay so net worth is the liabilities to the owners of the company what in, in finance we say owners in law we don't say owners but in finance here since we are discussing finance we'll say the word we use the word owners the or we can make it even more precise and say uh, the net worth is the, basically the liabilities of the company to the shareholders of the company okay the equity shareholders of the company the liabilities to the equity shareholders is the net worth okay please follow here what is going on okay and the high level two level categorization on the liability side is net worth and outside liabilities this is clear all the debt is outside liabilities everything that is not debt okay preference shares also will keep it as debt okay and uh, everything else is basically liability so reserves and surplus everything is share capital paid up share capital reserves and surplus everything is contained under net worth okay and so you have the high level split in the on the liability side net worth and outside liabilities in this case uh, outside liabilities are further split into three loans one in yen one in aussie and one in dollars okay don't worry about the amounts but just focus on the qualitative aspects okay so we have three loans the objective here is to introduce all kinds of risk okay which you will now subsequently manage through your project okay so now yeah Sir, this was in the uh, context of U.S. balance sheet. Yes, correct. Good question. Good question. Yeah. So this another point which you see it's there in your case notes. I'm just explaining the case before making you read it. Okay. So uh, this is a this company is a we can actually take that uh, prompt to open the case and see. The main point, the point that uh, Mayor has asked us uh, has basically led us to, is that this is a us dollar based company which means essentially all their revenue so in risk management becomes one of the important things that you have to look at is uh, asset liability mismatches in the sense your revenues are like your assets because if you do all assume in a, in a, in a simplistic scenario that all your sales are cash sales all your sales are cash sales okay and uh, so if you sell everything uh, very quickly and everything is in cash okay so your assets are basically almost tending to be all cash okay and if you're doing all your sales revenue is in US dollars okay that means your assets are essentially in US dollars okay although sales revenue is a flow concept assets are a stock concept but we are just converting this because we want to discuss the term asset liability mismatch and the liabilities are whatever loans you have okay uh, so we don't when we say liabilities when we say asset liability mismatch we are really concerned with asset to outside liabilities mismatch we are not so much concerned with the uh, although that is a secondary concern the the liabilities to the shareholders we are not so concerned with that mainly we are concerned with outside liabilities because that's where the risk is are you following the discussion yes okay so asset liability mismatch is always a very important consideration in risk management okay so ideally we don't want to see any asset liability mismatch so what we are saying here is that the revenues of the company are in us dollars only all right so this already cues and cues you into the any uh, to looking for any asset liability mismatch so now uh, now that you have this information that the revenues of this company are only in us dollars that means the assets are in us dollars okay therefore if they have any non us dollar liability there will be a straight away you can see there's an asset liability mismatch okay but that's not the end of the story in terms of uh, risk on the liability side because there's also going to be uh, there is a dollar loan here which we have to uh, which is yeah this dollar loan is not mentioned in the main um, okay the US dollar loan has a rate intra index to three month LIBOR okay so the other type of risk that you can have this is an example of interest rate risk okay so uh, if we go back to this you will see that there is an introduction of why have I made this company have only US dollar assets because I want to create all these asset liability mismatches which you will now have to manage okay so you'll see here that there is actually commodity price risk 
there is so we are covering all the asset classes the only asset class we are not covering is equities because equities you already have a very good exposure to equities with cash equities on the NSE and US equity options you have a pretty good exposure to equities now we are looking at the other asset classes so commodities then currencies you have currency risk over here straight away because your assets are in US dollars and you've got loans in yen and Aussie so if there is any uh, strengthening of the Aussie against the US dollar is it good for them or bad for them no. bad for them because if the Aussie strengthens against the US dollar okay then the dollar value of their liabilities will go up because each Aussie is buying more US dollars okay because your liabilities now once you took a two and a half million dollar Aussie loan the bank will want back want you to pay them back two and a half million Aussie whatever happens to the Aussie FX rate if they're not concerned with that so you will pay back only with US dollars okay so therefore if uh, the Aussie strengthens against the US dollar it will cost you more US dollars per unit of Aussie to repay so therefore you're going to have losses okay so therefore you are concerned with any strengthening of the so this is a basic framework of asset liability uh, mismatches okay so all these elements will come into the discussion so I'm just giving you a broad yeah here commodity price risk is coming here we have not come to the discussion of that I just told you that this is there we'll see the discussion we'll see the risk yeah I'm just giving you a broad overview yeah yeah one minute where is it this one okay this one is um, yeah this is just the <laughs> this is just the input basically I have made this um, <laughs> instead of writing billions of dollars every time I have just uh, this is just my input uh, thing like here here I have made it in billions and this is in millions okay. so here I enter 2.5 okay so this is basically just for my convenience okay all right so uh, is this framework clear you're getting some flavor of what is involved okay you have a balance sheet that we look at the conceptual framework framework yeah yeah uh, this AUD loan yeah uh, this amount is dollar now everything is paid over here is uh, this is an Aussie amount okay listen to the this is an Aussie amount this is 250 Aussie not 250 2.5 million yeah, Aussie okay 2.5 million Aussie and what is this there's so many comments I can't position this is <laughs> okay now this is the dollar equivalent okay because it's a dollar balance sheet this is a US US based company <coughs> It's a US based company which prepares its financials in US dollars and it only has a do US dollar revenues. So in any case, it will have to prepare financial in US dollars. OK, so what we are concerned with basically what's going to happen, we can see firsthand what will happen in the case of currency risk. OK, now watch this, guys. See what will happen on the on the plat uh, on the thing. So your net worth right now is to slightly over two million. OK, now what happens to the net worth? Observe if what happens to the net worth and what happens to this figure. OK so right now the Aussie is 6789 okay so if I, I can't even write with so many uh, so I'll have to basically move it this way uh, uh, that is too complicated okay we'll do that I can do that okay no I think there's a shorter way to so move it like a game console just move my uh, up and down arrows okay all right guys now let's notice what happens okay now on the left hand side of this you have a two and a half million is the Aussie amount of the loan that doesn't change okay but now I'm going to make the Aussie strengthen so what watch what happens to this uh, the dollar amount here okay watch what happens to the dollar amount this will go up and where will the adjustment come is my question clear on the liability side what is happening the dollar the Aussie loan, the dollar equivalent liability of the Aussie loan okay not a very happy construction of sentences but the dollar equivalent value of the Aussie loan on the liability side is going to go up okay is total assets going up total assets not going up so total liabilities also can't go up but what is happening is total liabilities will, will not go up but one of the liability components dollar amount is going up okay so what what has to adjust net worth, net worth has to adjust so this will go up and net worth will come down and this will not change so notice that okay 6.7 yes 
so kushbu you can look up your yeah, magic we are going to do some magic now <laughs> you can see what happens okay so 6 point let's make it point 69 okay ah uh, magic has happened no yes is it happening no change in total liabilities <coughs> but aussie loan component of the liability has gone up and adjustment as parul has correctly pointed out has come in the net worth is the logic clear to everybody so how is it coming in net worth how is the difference coming in net worth because the amount that we put the share holders hmm. means that the share price is getting affected No share price may or may not be affected. So how come the net worth? Uh, net worth is nothing to do with share price. I mean, I should say nothing to do with. So that's a very strong statement. But net worth relates to book value. Share first understand this basic difference. Net worth relates. Net worth is a book value concept. Okay, that is it's related to the financial statements, and market price uh, and share price is a market value concept. So you have to make this basic distinction between book value and market value. You have to understand the basic difference. So that's why I didn't want to make a blanket statement like it will not affect the share price. It may or may not affect the share price. We don't really know. Okay. Sometimes the share market reacts. Sometimes it doesn't. So we can't really say. But the point is, what we can definitely say <coughs> is, if you have a situation like this where the Aussie strengthens, okay, you have an Aussie loan with US dollar assets, you have an Aussie liability, okay, and the aussie strengthens okay so you have a manifestation of currency risk so what will happen is that because the aussie amount of the loan remains the same but per aussie there is more us dollars now uh, the the us dollar value of each aussie is now higher so therefore the total us dollar equivalent of this aussie loan is now gone up yes now coming to answer first let's answer mehak's question okay uh, now what happens total assets has not gone up right so therefore total liabilities also can't go up yes you agree now if total liabilities can't go up but one of the liability components has been increased then something else has to be decreased so your question is only why should it be net worth okay but conceptually think about what is net worth because see think about this this way this is a loan because that's why i said we have to be conscious of the high level split on the liability side net worth and outside liabilities the reason we use the word outside is because the anybody who's not a shareholder we consider them an outsider okay let's say okay that's why yeah because the payments to shareholders are optional okay they may not get any money at all that's what they signed up for right okay so the uh, sh so that's why you have the high level split on the liability side as net worth and outside liabilities so all these three are outside liabilities and this is your net worth okay so if one of so the south sea the the aussie lama uh, aussie the dollar amount of the aussie loan has gone up now can will the yen lender accept a reduction in the principal as a compensation so one thing you know is that because the total assets is not changing so total liabilities can't change so some other component has to change okay and the high level split is net worth and outside liabilities so if you look at any component of outside liabilities no lender is going to accept a reduction the japanese bank is not going to accept a reduction in their loan principal because uh, your aussie has strengthened against the us dollar they are not bothered okay the us dollar us bank is also not going to accept a reduction of us dollar principal so outside liabilities cannot be touched you cannot tinker with the principal repayment of the outside liabilities and the interest repayment also you can't tinker with them unless you go in for a uh, debt rescheduling and all that which they are trying to do with many of these uh, you know distressed real estate companies and ilfs and all these people right okay which is uh, chuk zeria now credit analysis right <laughs> so all these uh, rescheduling of payments and all these things okay that you do um, that you will have to do but that is not something that happens on a regular basis yes clear okay yeah in accounting standards net worth net worth is a part of liability yeah i am not saying it's not a part of liability you see it is shown on the liability side because if you add this when we balance it out there's a 206475 to balance on asset side one minute one minute one minute just hold on one sec what is the total here 4.7 can you see so uh, you can't see it but if i yeah if i add the outside liabilities 
if I add the outside liabilities, it comes to only 4.7. Okay, the total liabilities is 6.7. The balance is coming from this 2.064 of the net worth. Okay, so let's look at the high level understanding of the balance sheet that for obviously assets has to equal liabilities and on the liabilities side we are doing a high level split of net worth and outside liabilities utilized liabilities all kinds of debt. Okay, so because any any if the dollar equivalent of any debt has to go has gone up in value you cannot uh, make any other component of outside liabilities take the hit because no lender will accept a reduction in principle. Yes, clear. Everyone is clear. Yeah. So the hit will always be taken by net worth. Yes, everyone follows. That is why shareholders exist. They are there. They are what kind? They are providing the risk capital. Bondholders are not providing risk capital. Shareholders are providing risk capital. Okay, that's why they stand at the end of the line. They are the last to eat. Okay, if Garvid has eaten all the pizzas, then shareholders cannot eat anything, right? So therefore, they are their their income is optional. Okay, so therefore, uh, they are the. That's why we say net worth is a residual concept. If you remember when I did the Solomon case with you guys, then I explained this concept that net worth is a residual. You understand this term residual? Yes. yes. Net worth, yeah. Residual is what is left over at the end of the drink, okay? Uh, when you drink coffee or tea, there's some little bit left over. That residue, okay? So residual comes from the word residue. Net worth is a residual concept because it's left over, whatever is left over after deducting total outside liabilities from total assets, okay? Or let's say uh, deducting outside liabilities from total assets. <coughs> what is left over is net worth. So if the total value of your outside liabilities goes up, then net worth has to do the adjusting. Yes, is the concept clear? Conceptually also now it's clear because who eats the losses? The shareholders, <coughs> they eat the losses. That's why there's a problem. You must have come across this term of uh, shareholder theory, shareholder value versus stakeholders, stakeholder theory and all that. That companies should look after all the stakeholders instead of shareholders. The biggest problem with that theory is who eats the losses? Only the shareholders eat the losses. So they are special. They have to be treated as special people because if, if you treat them as just like everybody else, okay, then they'll then they they won't be the only then they'll say we sh why should only we eat the losses let the workers also eat the losses let the suppliers also eat the losses right you are you're familiar with stakeholder theory you know this they have even said certain versions of stakeholder theory they've said even terrorists are stakeholders so you should have to run your company to satisfy terrorists they have even said things like this you know community development and all that so then i'll say if i have a loss then let the community also share my loss will they share my loss no so this the problem with this theory is that because the shareholder is the only one who eats the losses so he has to be treated he has to be put above everybody else because otherwise he will not agree to eat the losses because then and so on the other side what will happen so let's revert this now is everyone clear about this whenever there's any loss so you should basically your conceptual uh, understanding should be like this that high level assets have to equal liabilities on the liability side you always have outside liabilities and net worth okay and net worth is a residual concept is everyone clear about this now why net worth is residual whatever happens to total assets total outside outside liabilities will not change okay in the sense on i mean the the local uh, the original currency of the outside liability this amount will not change these amounts okay so if there's any change in this so if, if uh, total assets minus outside liabilities whatever is left over is your net worth so in this case what happened the total assets did not change but the outside liabilities amount went up okay because the dollar amount of the aussie loan went up and the others remain the same the other two loan values remain the same like this one this one remained the same and this one remained the same you can see my cursor moving yeah these two remain the same outside liability components but this one went up yes so total outside liabilities went up yes but total liabilities did not go up so net worth has to take the hit the adjustment has to be to net worth it has to go down okay so this is basically what happens you can think of a loss if you always you know do a, if you are doing an instantaneous balance sheet conceptually if you think of a company doing a instantaneous balance sheet every every moment okay so whenever you take a loss your net worth will go down when you make a profit your net worth will go up 
if you buy all this stuff now we can see later on we'll do the exercises for this also okay but this basic concept is clear the net worth has gone down network is a residual concept okay i'll just explain one side on the other side one point on the other side okay now let me what did i control z no undo is control z okay so, so now 6789 now we'll make the aussie depreciate and see the impact on net worth okay now net worth should go up yes okay and this should go down dollar value of the aussie liability will go down because the aussie we are making it depreciate against the dollar and net worth should go up total assets and liabilities will not change yes okay so let's see that where how much do you want to make it appreciate let's make it 65 okay can you see this no change in outside li total liabilities net worth now you see what are the both sides so net worth being a residual concept doesn't mean that they are only getting the short end of the stick so they eat they they eat the losses and also enjoy the profits so super normal profits okay all these huge profits apple is making who is getting the real benefit of that the shareholders because they get unlimited profits right so now you can see why net worth is the residual when the residue has Im increased the shareholders get it the, it goes to the net worth okay because these guys will not accept a reduction in principle but at the same time they can't demand an increase in principle when the times are good yes everybody's clear so we had a brushing up of uh, of um, the accounting concept so i've taken one minute extra but i'm very happy with the performance today because it was it was uh, much more enjoyable teaching the class because there was not so much disturbance okay good yes you have a question you guys can go if you can go and I'll, I'll, I'll record your question Sir, this to give, a answer. give a mic give him a mic but whoever wants to go can go because the class is dismissed yeah i don't want to retain you guys beyond the time so just like we are forcing you to do everything in that break but then at the same time we should give you a 15 minute break okay yeah yeah sir i improvise answer to this question could be like uh, you are saying net worth so why net worth changes is because it has a concept of pnl that is reserves and surplus included into net worth yeah you will close it's like a it's like it's an, you are closing the pnl into the balance sheet yeah continuously that's where network because pnl yeah. goes into network yeah so that's, that's what happens. That's why it's increasing and decreasing. Yeah, yeah. That's, what, yeah that's a good point. That's a good point. That's an expansion. It's a verification of share capital PNL yeah. and uh, our reserves and surplus. So yeah. all three things, including PNL, will have an effect of this increasing and decreasing. Yeah. Right? And then it will go into network. Yeah, it is correct. So you're very, yeah, you actually, so share, we are, when in network, we are including both reserves and surplus yeah. and share capital. Yeah. And Those are balance sheet entities. Yeah. And PNL is a PNL concept. And so, will be effective. Due to this yeah so we are talking just in terms of net worth but you're right that it goes through the pnl yeah okay so you close from a you, accounting perspective it's coming from there yeah in you are like it's like we call it the closing you're closing the pnl into imagine that you're closing the pnl into the balance sheet yeah. Inst every moment we don't write pnl huh. but we include it into reserve and surplus. Yeah. so instantaneously it's getting yeah so you're doing it that way yeah it is correct it's coming through that no yeah. so if you have a pnl if you have a loss means what yeah. you have a debit balance yeah, loss yeah, means yeah, huh? yeah loss means you have a debit balance of the yeah. pnl so what will you do how will you close the pnl into the balance sheet? you credit the pnl yeah. and debit the net worth yeah. i'm just calling it net worth yeah. because it's a catch all term it's a catch all term it includes your reserves and surplus everything okay paid up share capital everything is i just use the word net worth to capture everything okay all the money that belongs to shareholders yes okay so you close that pnl you you credit that pnl debit balance and you debit the net worth okay that's how it gets so, uh, in, uh, where you were changing the price this is 0.65 per dollar Aussie, uh, yeah if you see now if you look at the aussie chart okay if we close uh, okay if you look at this how is the aussie coded how is the aussie coded what is the base asset in aussie when you are trading spot aussie what is the base asset aussie terms asset is us so spot aussie and aussie futures both are traded in the same way 
with Aussie as the base asset yeah. okay so uh, here 0.68 you can see the figure here also 0 0.6831 means each Aussie buys 68 US cents 68.31 US cents yeah this is yeah. so dollar is the the dollar US dollar is the terms asset okay so this means that each uh, one Australian dollar buys uh, 68.31 US cents or you can say 0.6831 US dollars yes because 100 cents is equal to one dollar when you uh, when you change this 0 0.67 to 69 uh, at that time how is it appreciate no no it Appreciate. Any remember the rules that I have taught you, and all the rules are backed up by logic. When we studied charts, what did we say? When we studied in any market, see a chart will be for any market. Understand this clearly now, okay? The chart will be for any market. So, this kind of thinking, once your concepts are clear, you can do it like that, okay? That any for any market, you have a chart. You should know immediately what the base asset is. Chart going down means base asset is depreciating. Yes. Chart going up means base asset is appreciating. Yeah. Okay. So in this case, when the Aussie is the base asset, okay. So if it is going up, that means it's appreciating. And if the chart is going up, it, and chart is going up means values are increasing because this is a normal scale, not an inverted scale. This means base asset is appreciating. Yeah. Because normally we draw charts with a normal scale, not an inverted scale, which means lower numbers are lower and these are magnitude of these higher numbers are higher on top, right? Normal scale, right? You're going from low to high. So in a normal scale chart, then what will happen whenever the chart is going up means the base asset is appreciating. And we have to pay more dollars. Yeah, in general terms, you have to pay more of the terms asset per unit of the base asset. Okay, so this is this was already discussed when we were discussing charts. Remember, you have to refresh that. So all these basic foundations are already laid before, so that you can understand. So once you understand this concept, then because in real life you can't afford to, when you are looking at a chart, you can't afford to go back and think through the logic. You should be clear about the logic, but you should have done it so many times that instantly you'll know that the, when the chart is going up, means base asset is appreciating. Yes, this is clear. So when we increase this, we made this. Uh, you switched it off. Yeah. Okay, so where was the and I have to go control Z again. No, I want to go back to the original values. So now I've gone back to 67.89. Okay, I've brought it down, I made it depreciate to 65. Okay, now we are back to 67.89. Okay, this is clear. Okay, you're finding this interesting? Yes, yeah, sir. Okay, good. So in project, you have to manage this. Yeah, you will have to manage this balance sheet. Tomorrow. Yeah. Tomorrow it will take many sessions because many concepts have to be uh, cleared up. No, because these are. I'll put all this. I'll put this uh, notes into your uh, re, into your notes so that you have to. Read. You have to hedge. You have to run a hedge book. Okay. So now, this shouldn't change. Yeah. Now, no, no. It will change. Basically, you will have to do a. You will have to run a. You will have to run a hedge PNL. Yeah. See, basically, what will happen is one minute. I'll explain later on. But the point is basically what you'll have to run is you'll have to understand the exposures first. You have to understand which side you are exposed on okay here the concept now one of the decision problems will change when we see we have done the decision problems mm -hmm. earlier earlier we used to decide whether to buy or sell in this case what you will see is whether to buy or sell that decision problem is automatically solved because now you are working with a hedger's balance sheet yeah, that is done what is the underlying position here you have to understand what is the underlying position underlying position in uh, Aussie dollar is what are you Aussie, we are long no, no. You're short Aussie. You're short Aussie. You so have to understand that because of this, like in this example, you have to understand the underlying position. Okay, so we'll have all we these have discussions. Okay. We have borrowed Aussie, so we are actually short Aussie. We are short Aussie. So we'll basically fig we'll give you the rule. I'll give you the logic for figuring out how to figure out whether you're long or short in the underlying position. Okay, so you, in this case, you're short Aussie. Yeah, the assets are long. Okay, these are short. Okay, but here. No, in the case of the market, you will have to understand here. Here, actually, you are long dollar yen. Yeah, we are. You are long dollar yen. You are short yen, actually. Long dollar yen. Here also, you are short, short yen. You are short yen. Okay. And this, of course, this is the floating rate. This is the index. You are short. It's like you are short LIBOR. This is our loan, no? This is a yeah. This is a dollar loan. So there is no currency risk, but there is interest rate risk because it's a floating rate loan. Yeah. So you are short cost, LIBOR. Cost of Okay. So you are short LIBOR because it's a floating rate loan. So all these things. So you'll have the exposures now. You have to manage. Now what? So because you are already short, 
so the question of buy or sell has already been solved you can only buy now you have to counter that through futures yes you'll have to run a separate like a separate like two flows of an airport okay arrival and departure yeah. now the arrival has already been fixed yeah. and now on the departure you're playing around on the departure if Pulkit is walking around mm -hmm. here the arrival you have to shadow him yeah okay you actually have to shadow him on the other that side will do so whatever you're losing on the arrival side and you have to make up on the departure side that yeah. future will do now we just have you to have to do it that position. way you have to take the position accordingly you have to take position so you have to again eventually what will happen is at bottom line go back to the same old problem you have to take a view on the markets okay. that means if that you buy you are giving us that is what you have to do. That's your job. No, but you have given us an amount of 2 million. 1 million. 1 million. Account has only 1 million. Yeah, 1 million. So you will have to basically decide what is the right type. Is the Aussie going to appreciate now? Because if you buy it now and it actually depreciates, that means in retrospect you should not have bought it. Because you're only concerned, you're short Aussie, so you're only concerned if the Aussie goes up. But if you think the Aussie is actually going down, you should not be hedging. So you have to time the hedge. Okay. So your buy sell problem has been solved. Whether to buy or sell is automatically solved, but whether to at what price, whether to enter at market or to enter at using a limit order or a stop order, that problem will remain. So these are the nuances that you will see how the decision problems change in a hedging context. Is this clear? So these are the figure, these were the figures for the project. Yes, this is these are these basically are the, the figures. figures. These are the actual figures. This is okay. what we have to work upon. Yeah. And the actual market prices I will freeze when the project starts. Okay. But these are the figures. But the figures don't matter because the logic is the That's same. Position size we have. Position size. But what you are practicing really is not so much the size. You are practicing really is the question is okay. you are looking at this. Ha, you know that your balance sheet is short Aussie. Yeah. What you are really doing is your what the training that is actually happening through this project is you have a balance sheet which is short Aussie. Now you are looking at the Aussie chart or looking at the Aussie fundamentals and taking a view is the Aussie likely to appreciate if the Aussie is likely to appreciate then you better hedge everything right now right now okay so everything is down to market timing what you're practicing is market timing so whether you're doing one contract or 10 million contracts it makes no difference in your project it makes a difference but in terms of your learning and conceptual clarity it makes no difference in terms of the logic that you're learning it makes no difference position size is if you are working for let's say Exxon Mobil in Houston okay selling 10,000 oil contracts at a time the logic will not change mm -hmm. obviously your account is much bigger so you are just scaling up the size of the positions but the thinking does not change what we are teaching you in the MBA program is the thinking process right so the logic will not so the theory will not change right so okay. I have a question yeah. like, uh, you said that the main components in the liability side will be net worth and other uh, liabilities one minute so finally Maya has become interested <laughs> well, normally she is looking at her whatsapp but today she has a question yes so uh, yeah. uh, net worth and other liabilities yes uh, so in the, in the, the high level no not other we should the term that we should use is outside liabilities. outside liabilities okay because these are liabilities to outside means we are to refer using the word outside to mm -hmm. refer to people who are not the equity shareholders of the company or mm -hmm. common shareholders of the company so uh, when we look at the indian balance sheet as well these are the main heads that yeah see in india we don't use this kind of terminology but conceptually this is the terminology you should have in your head okay mm -hmm. we may use all kinds like i'm using net worth so here we net worth would include reserves and surplus paid up share capital all these things but all of this we are capturing conceptually through net worth and the non-current liabilities and the current liabilities that would come under that is covered under c some of this basically here i have only yeah. shown non-current effectively you can think of it as because we want to teach you how to manage long-term loan risk okay? okay so these are all non-current liabilities you can think of it this way mm -hmm. because these are not short-term liabilities okay mm -hmm. so these are all non-current liabilities these are all in the nature of long-term loans because we want to use these uh, examples to teach you long. I mean, loan risk management on long-term so loans. So, taking the balance sheet that is at hmm? that is. Uh. You use the styloid, word. stylized. Styloid. It's a stylized balance sheet. Mm -hmm. So I have taken only certain types. I have not shown you everything that normally appears on a balance sheet. Yeah, in this is all capital line. Yeah, it's 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 like abstract, abstract balance sheet. Yeah, it's an abstraction. Okay, 
like a model is an abstraction of reality so i have done an abstraction of a balance sheet it's a stylized balance sheet where i have taken only certain types of items which appear normally on a balance sheet i'm not showing you like i'm not showing you fixed assets i'm not showing you current liabilities i'm not showing you any other current asset other than inventories no accounts receivable no mm -hmm. uh, cash nothing is being shown okay because i have all kinds of constraints because i have to remember the 1 million dollar size and then i have to look at the contract size on cme so the numbers don't matter so much uh, the the theory that we will learn through these numbers is exactly the same that you will apply even if you make this into a multi billion dollar balance sheet okay. like a big commodity company like rio tinto or exxon mobil uh, you know multi billion dollar exposures the logic and the theory will remain exactly the same it's your numbers will become much bigger but that doesn't change anything in terms of substance sir, sir what is it for the bond ytr and ir can we expect the same reason for the bond ytc one minute YTC is yield to call. Yes, sir. Yeah, your yeah, same, concept. same concept. Basically, yield to call. What is happening is your maturity date is just being arbitrarily shifted by the issuer calling the bond. Okay, mm -hmm. so you don't really, you can't really predict when unless there's a fixed uh, provision for that. But normally, it is just option that the issuer has. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in the case of yield to call, what is happening is your same. The con the answer to your question is that it's the same. Mm -hmm. Mathematically, there's still no difference. Okay, so yield to call is a, not an expression that we use normally. First, the more commonly used expression is normally we discuss in terms of YTM. But yield to call is basically just that the uh, issuer is artificially shortening the maturity of the bond. By exercising his call option, mm. okay. So it's the same concept. The same terms will appear. In this case, the payment payment of principal will happen at an earlier date than what you thought would actually happen earlier. Is this clear? Yes. Okay, good. Thanks. So Mayak should maintain this level of interest. Yes, the next clause is the no more WhatsApp. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks.